studying from Exodus, the 17th chapter, in this hour of worship. So you might go ahead and turn over there, Exodus chapter 17, and we'll begin there in verse 8. Exodus 17 and verse 8, it's a familiar um, account for us of the Israelites and their beginning and their journey to the promised land. Next, this 8, 17 and verse 8, the text reads, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim, and Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I believe that this text is a powerful example and illustration of the deliverance and the victory that God provides us. And what it does is it exhorts us, it beckons us to have faith in Him and to have confidence in Him because of the power and provision that He gives us. But I want us to think about this in its in its context of what has happened in leading up to this point. And I think that it's very telling, and I think that it certainly is beneficial for us to consider. The Egyptians had been slave drivers to the Israelites for some time now. You remember that they would be in captivity for 400 years before they would ever be released to go to the promised land, is what was told Abraham. And so they are in captivity. There's a Pharaoh who does not know Joseph and they are not treating the Israelites very properly. And so God hears the cry of His people in Exodus 3 and in verse 7, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, verse 7 of Exodus 3, have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and bring them up from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, he says. And I want us to be impressed by what he'd go on to say. We remember when he told Moses that you're going to lead them. And he asks, who am I going to say you are who sent me to my brethren when they ask? Who am I? And we remember his uh, excuses in the next chapter as well. Be impressed with what God told him in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. That that phrase, I am, and we remember Jesus used it several times and just as itself, I am. Not just I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life, but I am, in John chapter 8, is what he stressed. It stands to represent eternal nature. He is. He, he, he was not and is going to be. He is. He always has been, always will be. He is. He is the eternal God. He's the one and only true God, is essentially what he's saying. Tell them that the eternal creator of the universe sent you. But then he says in verse 15, the Lord God of your fathers. That is placing the personal name of God with the fact that He's the only God, Yahweh, God of your fathers. And so you remember that name that was revealed to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. They didn't fully recognize its significance. That's my name. I'm not the God of the sun. I'm not the God of the frogs or the fleas or anything like that. I am the God, the only God, 
the self-existent one, and my name is Jehovah. And he said, I'm going to deliver you. I made that promise, and now I'm following through with it. And so Yahweh, his name stands to represent true divinity, true power, true love, and faithfulness, and deliverance, and covenant. That's what he's associating with his name here. I hear your cry. I hear your oppression. I see how things are. I am Yahweh, your God, and I will deliver you. That was the point. Vine says, God explained that he was not only the God who exists, but the God who affects his will. Not only do I exist and I'm here, but I'm here for you and the promise I made you I'm about to fulfill. And so we know that he gave them deliverance. In chapter 14 of Exodus, he parted the Red Sea. They passed through as on dry land. Moses told the people, see the salvation of Yahweh, the Lord. And it said that Yahweh, the Lord, gave them that salvation and delivered them. So they believed on the Lord because of his deliverance. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 how the Apostle Paul used that language to show that the Christians in Corinth had been saved. They received salvation just like the children of Israel did back here. He calls it a baptism, that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's saying that they were saved, you were saved, and then they lost their lives, and you're going to lose your lives if you don't shape up. That's his point in 1 Corinthians 10. God gives us deliverance. He's faithful to that promise. He will re re reveal your sins and then forgive you of your sins. He has the power to wash them away where there's no more remembrance of them. He has the power to deliver you from the grips of Satan. But here's what happened to the Israelites when they were delivered. They lost faith. And then they lost their lives. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's saying don't follow their example. In Jude verse 5, it tells us that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So here you have deliverance, but then you have immediately after the deliverance, this faith waning. And it's interesting because they have not faced an enemy after Egyptian bondage yet. They've not gotten there. Their problems are self-inflicted. Notice in Exodus 15 and in verse 24, it says the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Here was bitter water. And you know what? Yahweh loves them. And he's keeping covenant with them. He didn't bring them out of Egypt to die. He brought them out of Egypt to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. But they're losing faith and they're complaining when there's a trial. God gave them the sweet water. In chapter 16, it says there in verse 2 that the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, saying, Oh, that we died from the hand, uh, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. You have brought us out of this, to this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So, complain of thirst. Now they're complaining about their food. So what does God do? He's faithful, isn't he? It's not like he's completely absent from this. He, he knows they need sustenance. He gives them manna in the morning and quail in the evening. Are they done complaining? Notice chapter 17. It says in verse 3, The people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? What's going on here? This is self-inflicted problems. They're not working on their faith. They're not trusting in God. They're not meditating on what God has already done for them. And so when their faith is tested here, it fails. They complain about thirst again. And God brings them water from a rock. That's what's going on here. They were saved, and now they're complaining against the one who saved them. They're acting as though the one who saved them is no longer among them, verse 7. That's what it says they were testing. Is he among us or not? They had no reason to doubt that he was. But they're complaining. It's interesting that in Philippians chapter 2, Paul alludes back to these people again. And he talks about how we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And God is actually working in us 
toward our salvation. But then he says in verse 14, do all things without complaining or disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Listen, what we learn here is that our initial point of becoming a child of God is not our total salvation. And not only that, but when we're saved, one of the greatest obstacles we face is ourselves, getting out of our own way and trusting in God. And so internal conflict can keep us from the promised land. It's amazing to me how they were saved and then they complained to their Savior. When a Christian doesn't want to come to church, when a Christian is is complaining about someone confronting them with sin or and confronting them with their need to get better or or whatever it is, when a Christian complains as they're supposed to be serving God in joy, they're making the same mistake. And that's a great threat we face. But here's what's interesting. They're saved and they have internal conflict and now they get to Rephidim. And now they realize that as much as they're struggling with themselves, as much as temptation comes from within, and my own desires might lead me away if I'm not careful, there is an active outside enemy trying to destroy me. They learned that with Amalek. And so they come to, to Amalek. And up to this point, they, they hadn't had that kind of conflict. But, but now they realize, here's some foreign enemies that are trying to kill me. And so Amalek fought with them. In chapter 17 and verses 14 and 16, it tells us that God determined to, to destroy, utterly blot out Amalek and, and make war with them. And I want us to notice this, the insidious nature of this attack. Why would God want to utterly blot them out? What was so bad about what happened here? You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when God finally gave the command to the first king of Israel, Saul, to go and utterly demolish the Amalekites, utterly wipe them out. He said that he ambushed Israel on the way when he came up from Egypt. This was deceptive and cunning. This was an ambush, but even more than that, in Deuteronomy 25 and in verse 17, he reminds the children of Israel, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how you, he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. That's what happened here. I want us to be impressed by how dirty Amalek fought. And, and in that, he says they did not fear God. We, we learn from Joshua chapter 2 when the spies are sent into Jericho and Rahab receives them, how she, she made it very clear that the entire inhabitants of the Canaan land heard what happened in the Exodus. And our hearts melted like wax within us. You think Amalek heard what happened? You think they heard how the one and only true God as it's evidenced in the fact that all the false gods of Egypt are squashed by his power and did not stand a chance? How that means that this is the creator of the universe? Obviously, they didn't accept it. You say, how are they supposed to, as a foreign Gentile pagan people, fear God? God called the Gentiles to obedience and submission as well. And so here's the one and only true God, his people, who he chose, who he's to protect, who he's to provide for, and unbeknownst to them, through whom he'll bring salvation to the entire world. They don't revere him. They don't help them. They ambush them, attack their weak, and seek to utterly wipe them out. It was not just, I'm going to beat you up and take what you have and leave you alive. I'm going to destroy you and demolish you. That was in their mind. Balaam, in his prophecy concerning Israel, in Numbers 24 and verse 20, described Amalek in this way. Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. What does he mean by that? They were going to fight enemies. They were going to find people who wanted to destroy them. Amalek kicked it off. Amalek is notorious for being the first nation 
to seek to thwart God's will, ultimately to bring salvation to the world through Israel. Here's what we learn from this. While we are saved at the point of baptism and become God's child, that is not the end of our journey of salvation. We have not been fully saved yet. That's in the form of a promise. We have hope. And if we start complaining and we lose faith, we'll lose our souls. But not only do we have to worry about the inward struggle, and we could talk about this in regard to a congregational context as well, not only do we have to worry about the inward struggle, but there will always be the foreign enemy of Satan. And he does not fight fair. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 10, the Apostle Paul encouraged to take up the armor of God, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of the darkness of His age and the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Like Amalek sought to fight dirty and completely demolish Israel. Satan's trying to do that every day. He's cunning, he's deceitful, and he's always on the prowl. And we need to realize that. But here's, here's where Exodus 17 comes in with the positive. Amalek fought dirty. They ambushed Israel. Israel was not expecting this. They ambushed Israel. They attacked their weak ones, the stragglers at the back, completely cowardly. And you would think that Israel was done for. But in Exodus 17 and verse 13, it says, Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And God promised to utterly destroy them, to blot them out. And in in honor and praise of God, Here's what happened, verse 14. They wrote as a memorial in the book and recounted it in the hearing of Joshua that he'll utterly blot out Amalek. They built an altar and called its name Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Satan is constantly trying to destroy us. How will we ever defeat him? This is the answer. This is the answer that the Israelites have on display for us, that God determined to record for our learning, our admonition, to give us comfort, to give us peace, to give us hope, to give us confidence and power to withstand in the evil day. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. And verse 16, it says... For he said, and what it's doing is it's explaining that name, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. What do you mean by that? And it says, because the Lord has sworn I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The language literally says, a hand is upon the throne of the Lord. And some take that to mean God is putting his hand on his throne and swearing by his throne that I'm going to destroy Amalek, the 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 uh one, one translation says, because he has sworn with a hand upon the throne, the Legacy Standard Bible, because he has sworn with a hand upon the throne. And what that is, is it's an interpretation. It's not a direct translation. Barnes, I think, rightly comments, it has no parallel in scriptural usage. When God swears, he swears by himself and not by his throne. It's explaining the Lord is my banner, which is a perspective of the people. I am saying the Lord is my banner for verse 16. So here's one of the ways it could be translated. The ESV says, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So I'm saying upon a hand upon the throne of the Lord. Upon could be translated towards or up to. And so here's what Kyle and Delich suggests. All of that to say this, the explanation of the Lord is my banner, my perspective, the people's perspective who were just saved, who just gained victory through God, the hand lifted up to the throne of Jehovah in heaven. I'm lifting my hand up to the throne of Jehovah in heaven because he is my banner and he'll fight for me. That's what it's saying. The Lord is my banner. He'll fight for me. 
And I think this hand lifted up to the throne of heaven is a reflection of what we know very well in this story in verse 11. So it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And so what it's saying is that you need to remember by this altar, a memorial to the Lord, that he is your banner. And what that means for you is in time of conflict and war, you hold your hands up to him because he's the one that's going to give you the victory. You appeal to him. He's your salvation. He is the one who will fight for you. The Lord is my banner. I think we can understand its meaning by the explanation in verse 16 more clearly. You think about a banner. A banner in, in time of military conflict especially. You fly that American flag in battle. Why do you do that? What purpose does it serve? It may be a rallying point for sure that the troops need to gather over here. This is where the, the leaders are over here. This is where the conflict is over here. This is where we're going to re regroup over here. You see the flag. You go to it. But also... It gives a profound sense of duty and purpose and strength and confidence. And if there's any evidence from your nation or your leaders and your rulers under that banner which you fight for victory, it means victory to you. And so that's what he's saying. The Lord is my banner. I fight with the power of God under the direction of God, I fight for God, I fight with God, and that gives us all the confidence we need, doesn't it? We sing a song sometimes. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. That royal banner is the cross. That's victory. That's confidence. That's assurance. That's salvation. The Lord is my banner. It made clear that while God fights for, for his people, he's their power for salvation. It's incumbent upon us to appeal to him. That's what it's saying. Lift up your hand to the throne of God. Appeal to him for that victory. The Lord is my banner. There are a few ways that that is demonstrated in this particular account. He's our banner, so how do we lift up our hands to him? How do we appeal to him? who is our power, who is our salvation, who is our victory over all things, including the devil who is constantly seeking to take our lives. Well, I want us to notice in verse 9 of Exodus 17 that Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men and go out and fight, but I will stand up on the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And he took with him Aaron and Hur, and so he raised up the rod, and they prevailed. And when he got weary and he lowered that rod, they started to lose. But then Aaron and Hur helped him hold up his hands, and they prevailed again. I think we're familiar with that rod of God. In Exodus 4, chapter 4, it's introduced. Moses had a rod. And so how is he going to, to convince the people that God is with him? How is he going to convince... Pharaoh, that God is behind this, you take that rod and you perform these miracles. And so it represented the presence and power of God. In fact, he stretched it forth over the waters of the Red Sea and parted the Red Sea. Who did that? God did. But the rod was a representative of the power and presence of God. Here's the difference. The rod's connection with miraculous events was always by the direction of God. He told Aaron in all of the plagues... And in the Exodus, as they parted the Red Sea, to stretch forth the rod and do something. And then God would perform this miracle. But with Amalek, you don't see that instruction. What you have is Moses' connection with that rod. He remembers what it did for them, what God did for them, and the rod representing God's action and His power. He knows what that means. He knows God's the one that's going to deliver them here. So here's what he says. Joshua, you take them in because I know we've got to do something. We've got to fight. Faith requires us working with God, Philippians 2 and verse 12, as he works in us both to do and to will for his good pleasure, verse 13. And so you need to take your men and you need to go fight. But I, I'm not going to be a part of that fight. I'm going to go up on the hill and I'm going to raise the rod of God. God didn't tell him to do that. What's Moses doing? Let me suggest to you that he's lifting up that rod because he realizes its connection with the presence and power of God, but because God didn't say anything about how this was going to 
play out, how they would be delivered. He's petitioning God incessantly for deliverance. He's got his hands up to the throne of God. And that's what we see as a posture of prayer throughout the Old Testament. I'm not saying that this is the necessary posture of prayer, but culturally, this is what the Jews did. Psalm 28 and verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Psalm 134 and verse 2. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Psalm 141 and verse 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, lifting up my hands as this evening sacrifice. And Lamentations 3 and verse 40. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8 we're familiar with. I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so there's a posture of prayer evident within the Old Testament of lifting up your hands. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's how they prayed. This is what Kyle and Delich concluded, and I think rightly so. Not indeed by a merely spiritless and unthinking elevation of the staff, but by the power of his prayer, which was embodied in the lifting up of his hands with the staff. As long as Moses held up the staff, he drew down from God victorious powers for the Israelites by means of his prayer. Brethren, God is the power to salvation. God will deliver us from all evil and give us an eternal home in heaven. But if we do not appeal to Him and petition Him for help in time of need, for transformation and for strength, if we don't communicate with our General and our Savior, we don't stand a chance. We don't stand a chance. If Moses just told Joshua, you take these men and you go fight, and he just stood there, you think they would have won? There's power in prayer. There's necessity in prayer. He's our banner, so why don't we pray to him? In Ephesians 6 and verse 18, after saying, put on the whole armor of God, what does he conclude with? Of all things that he could talk about, this is what he concludes with. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You can put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, take the sword of the Spirit, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and peace, so on and so forth. And if you don't pray, you may fall short. He says, pray always. In James 1 and verse 5, it says, If any one of you, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. You've got to ask. You say, God knows that I need it, but you still got to ask. That's where the faith comes in. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, Peter says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. You say, I'm not, I'm not going to even think about this because God cares for me. It's going to take care of itself. No, you've got to give it to him. God knows. But the way this works is that we communicate by faith through prayer to him and it causes him to move that's what god wants he wants us to want him and he wants us to show that we fully rely upon him that we're fully dependent upon him that's why humility is always coupled with prayer humble yourself and cast your care upon him the attitude is not i got this i can handle this i don't need to tell god he already knows it The idea is, God, I know you know this, but I am so feeble and weak alone that I need you to help. That's what God wants. He just wants us to come to Him. And when things don't seem like they change immediately, He wants us to persist. In Luke 18, Jesus spoke a parable of the persistent widow, and He explained, Luke does, why He spoke that, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And in verse 8, it tells us, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Have you stopped praying? Do do you doubt that God is your banner? Do Do you doubt that God fights for you, that he cares for you, that he provides for you? Has that doubt manifested in you stopping bringing your cares and concerns and requests to him? 
We all got to think about this. James 5 and verse 16 tells us that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He is our banner, but we've got to petition him. And I will say this. They also fought. And so, so prayer is not this magical wish that is just granted immediately and without any of our action. When he says, if you lack wisdom in James 1 and verse 5, ask God, he'll give it to you. He's saying he will give it to you, but through the means and methods that he's chosen. And so you've got to study. You've got to be diligent, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's the same thing with any other kind of prayer. God, please give me financial security. You can't be foolish with your money. God, please give me a good and healthy marriage. You've got to work on that. You've got to love your wife. You've got to respect your husband. You've got to work together within the word of God. It doesn't just happen. It happens with God's help. And his help is always, has always required our faith. But secondly, I think what we learn from this is the need to support those who are our leaders. Because here's what happened. Moses, who is that great prophet, the leader of Israel, the lawgiver, goes up to that hill and he prays incessantly to God for victory, for deliverance. But his hands got weary. And he actually was provident in this. He thought forward about this may happen. So he took with him Aaron and her, and they went up there. And when his hands became unsteady, they let him sit on a stone, a rock, and they held his hands up for him. Moses was praying. Moses was leading. Moses was doing some work. But they were holding up his hands. You know, we use that phrase from time to time. We need to hold up so-and-so's hands. We need to hold up their hands. And what we're saying is that they've got a very important responsibility, a very important work, and it's cumbersome. It can be difficult. And while it's their work and their responsibility, you very may well be in a place that you could offer great support and encouragement. And that's what God tells us to do with our leaders. It is his design in the church to have elders appointed in every single church. And then he not only gives their qualifications and their very important duties and warnings, but then he tells the people to honor them and uphold their hands. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, We urge you, brethren, recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace with yourselves. You know, I don't think you even need to ask, but maybe it would be good to ask one of the shepherds here, is it hard? Is it stressful? Do do you lose sleep about the congregation because you love us so much? Is this work that important to you? Like I said, I don't think you need to ask to see it. But maybe, maybe that will be helpful. Just ask anyone who's ever served as an elder who or, who, who or, or who is serving as an elder if it's hard, if it's, if it's stressful, if it is actually work. And they'll let you know. Maybe we need to gain a, a greater respect for the great position that they hold. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, it tells us to follow their faith. But then in verse 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Here's the problem when we speak in context of elders and the responsibility of the church. Because everybody knows the best way when it's not their responsibility. I'm not saying we can't have our judgments and our thoughts and our opinions. And I'm not saying we don't have a responsibility as a congregation to hold our elders accountable as they hold us accountable. We study church discipline. They'd be involved in that as well. Here's the thing, though. Respect for a qualified man, respect for an individual who the Holy Spirit has made an overseer of a local church would require that we exhibit full confidence in them. 
that we have love that believes all things and hopes all things, and when there's no evidence that would lead us to a contrary conclusion, that we do not give them grief, but that we uphold their hands through our loving submission and our obedience and give them honor because honor is due them. That's what we see here. Moses couldn't have done it without the support of Aaron and her. And we need to think about that, don't we? Lastly, I think what we see here prophetically is that there would be a banner that would give us ultimate victory. It's interesting that in Isaiah chapter 11, in a context of the Messiah, that's the language the Holy Spirit used. So at the beginning of Israelite history as a nation, when they're going to inhabit the promised land, and someone tries to destroy them from the very start, they can't even get there before someone tries to destroy them. They have this memorial, this remembrance, that the Lord is my banner, and He gives me victory. And so you fast forward at a time when they've lost faith in that, and and they're going to go into captivity, and there's going to be misery misery and pain and anguish, and, and the prophet is telling them and warning them about this, but he's also giving them glimpses of the future where there's radiant hope. And he says this in verse 10 of Isaiah 11, And that day there shall be a root of Jesse, that's Jesus, that's the Messiah, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And then he talks about this second time where he will recover the remnant of his people who are left. Brethren, that's that spiritual remnant, a remnant of the remnant. It's the people who have accepted the Christ, who have rallied to him because he is our banner. But then notice in verse 12 through the end, He will set up a banner for the nations, will assemble the outcasts of Israel, gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy of Ephraim shall depart, the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall fly down upon shoulders of the the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east, shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab. The people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue in the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Syria as it was for Israel, Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. He will give us victory over the enemy. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul reflected on in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 17. When all else forsook me, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. May we find comfort knowing that the Lord is our banner. And when we do that, let's rally to him in prayer. Let's fight underneath that banner in faith and confidence, knowing that victory is over temptation, over sin, over the world, and over death, both spiritual and physical, is secured because the Lord is my banner. Through Christ, brethren, we gain the victory. Before we dismiss to our Bible classes, we'll be led in a word of closing prayer.